Um, so I spend my time looking at uh, computing systems for, for potential uh, security, operational issues, um, improving the uh, uptime. Uh, typically it's after companies have had issues with it and they're trying to figure out how to, uh, to best uh, re-architect their systems. And um, so I've been finding service mesh to be a, an efficient way to go about doing that. I'm also finding a lot of people don't know about service mesh, so that's why I put together this presentation, really to help uh, um, solve that issue. Uh, all of this content is up in GitHub, so if you're interested in the, the walkthrough that I'm doing today, you can go, you can uh, pull it all up in GitHub, you can download it, you can run it in your own infrastructure, or you can run it in some um, packet offers uh, infrastructure, they're a bare metal service provider, so you can run this whole workshop um, on their infrastructure. And uh, the whole presentation actually I put up on YouTube as well. So if there's something you didn't catch today, you can go and um, watch it on YouTube. Okay, so quick uh, agenda of what we're going to be doing today. I'm going to talk a little bit more about why I put together this pr presentation and decided to talk about it. Uh, and then we're going to go through a sort of a quasi-live presentation. So it's a, um, a walkthrough of a deployment of a service mesh, deployment of a microservice, and then the steps involved in actually securing that microservice and uh, what's involved with that. So we're, we're going to see some physical infrastructure being turned on. Uh, we're going to be uh, taking a look at that physical infrastructure, how it's configured, um, the security issues with it, um, how it can be uh, exploited, and then how the service mesh, how you turn it on, how you configure it, how you cluster it all together, and then what you have to do is to change your service to use that service mesh. So you'll see all of that in action. Uh, and then it, towards the end, we're going to take a look at some of the resilience that Microsoft, microservices, sorry, that, that the service mesh can provide by, um, we're actually going to be killing some of the uh, physical infrastructure, some of the nodes there. Okay, so let's go back to the to the agenda, top top item. Uh, what made me decide to present this, uh, put together this presentation? So when I go out and I take a look at um, computer systems, oftentimes I see old legacy systems where uh, companies might not have the source code anymore, they just have binaries or object files, so they can't go and spend the time to re-architect or they don't have the computing, the, staff on board to take a historical legacy application and uh, go through and add in authentication, authorization, encryption um, into the application. So they're looking for ways to add that on, put in that capability without having to go through a whole new development cycle. It's going to be very expensive. Um, talking to those security teams, I often find that they, they aren't aware of service mesh and what service mesh can provide. Um, so it's a little bit of an education process to them. A lot of times people think of service mesh and they immediately think of containers and oh, I need a container infrastructure, I need to uh, virtualize my environment, and that's really not the case. There is um, technology out there. So in, in this example, we're going to be taking a look at HashiCorp's uh, service mesh implementation and how that does not require uh, you to go and containerize your application. So with that, we are going to, like I said, I only had two slides. So we will switch and we will go and walk through the, the real implementation. Okay, so like I said, what you're gonna see here is the um, exact code base that I have up in GitHub. So you can see all the, the scripts and Terraform and uh, everything else that's used to uh, deploy this uh, physical structure and the service mesh on top of it. So. <clears throat> uh, um, I use the term zero trust. For those of you that aren't familiar with zero trust is, the idea is that your application, whatever workload you're running, does not want to have any implicit trust in the underlying infrastructure. So the physical infrastructure you're using, maybe it's in a remote data center, you don't own it, you, don't, uh, you can't really trust the uh, service provider that owns that hardware and manages it for you. So you want to make sure, and the, the network connecting those systems, uh, maybe it's running across the internet, or you don't uh, you don't know where that cabling goes, so you can't implicitly trust it. So the notion of zero trust is you're not relying, uh, you don't have any trust of that underlying infrastructure. So when you see the service mesh, the idea is that you don't have any um, trust in the underlying infrastructure. Um, sure, you can uh, you have trust that it's going to keep on running, but you really don't want to have trust in that your data is going to be secure going across the wire. So well. When we go through the microservice we're going to use here is something I call the fortune cookie service. So people that are familiar with old school Linux commands, uh, fortune is a command you could type on the command line and it would just give you back a random quote. So in this uh, 
example here, I've taken the fortune cookie service, turned it into a network service, so you connect to a TCP port and it's just going to spit you back um, a, a random fortune. So that's going to be our sample microservice that we're going to use and um, secure. Uh, when I go out and I'm talking to my clients about you know the, the type of services that they need to secure, it could be something you know similar like this. Uh, it could be a much larger manufacturing environment where they're running um, robots, they're running uh, programmable logic controllers, PLCs that are um, interconnected and. They're, um, they don't have any of the uh, authentication authorization on top of that, so they're looking to go through and secure that. Okay, so first things first, we're gonna go and deploy some uh, physical infrastructure. So <clears throat> we talked real quick about the Fortune uh, microservice. So that up there is actually the command that, that we're running. So we are just running it on port uh, 8181, it's a TCP process, and all it does is it just runs the Fortune command. So it's just this little, real simple, um, fortune cookie service. Uh, to connect to it, we're just using Netcat, we're just connecting to FCS, that's fortune cookie service, that's what F FCS stands for. We're gonna start up a bunch of instances of it, so that one happens to be instance zero, zero. Connect to port 8181, and then you see we get a response back of uh, fortune. Um, <clears throat> typical initial deployments without using a microservice is we're gonna run a fortune cookie service, and then we're gonna use a fortune cookie consumer, so FCC is the consumer. Uh, the Fortune cookie service is once again running on port TCP 80, 8181. The fortune cookie consumer connects on port 8181. The server doesn't know anything about the client that's connecting. It's just accepting connections from anyone. And then it's sending a response back and the response that's being sent back is unencrypted. So we've got unencrypted traffic and then we have an unauthenticated service running. So those are the two things that we want to, um, we want to correct. Um, the physical infrastructure we're running on, so the T1 small, those are um, uh, packet bare metal uh, server definitions. So we'll talk about them in a little bit. <clears throat> okay, so let's take a look about at how that is vulnerable. <clears throat> okay, so here we have a little sample of um, a TCP dump where we've gone and we've taken a look at the traffic that's flowing uh, back and forth between the fortune cookie uh, service and the fortune cookie consumer. By tapping in into this unencrypted traffic, we can actually see the data going across the wire. So uh, that goes back to the issue of this traffic being unencrypted. If you can't trust the underlying network, right, going back to zero trust, we wanna make sure that anyone who taps in and views our traffic going across between our services, they can't see it. So obviously we need to go and, and correct that somehow. Okay, so let's talk about real quick the uh, infrastructure we're going to deploy. Uh, we're going to deploy console 01, 0001, and 02. So we're going to have three console servers. That's HashiCorp's open source uh, service mesh implementation. Um, we're just deploying on the smallest uh, physical infrastructure I can get from Packet. It's a T1.small, it's an x86 machine. And then we're going to initially deploy one consumer and one server, so FCS00 and uh, um, FCC actually actually zero zero, um, and one of them is going to be just uh, have a port open eighty one eighty one. Uh, we're using Terraform to deploy it, so once again this is all up in uh, GitHub. So if you really want to dive into the details of it, but it just goes through details out um, all of the information which data center to deploy it on. We're initially going to deploy this into a single data center, so we're just going to use the Newark data center. Um, We'll talk a little bit later about how you could go and deploy this across multiple data centers and how Service Mesh um, supports that. So we will go through and next steps, we're gonna kick this off. <clears throat> okay, so I just did a GitHub uh, pull down everything. We take a look at the variables here. We can see the number of uh, console servers to run and the number of fortune cookie consumers and fortune cookie servers to run and the type of hardware. Uh, we're running three uh, console servers to start off with. The reason why is because it runs in a cluster environment, you want to have an odd number of servers to run. And so now we have gone kick this off. So at this point, Terraform is contacting the API, talking to our bare metal cloud provider and requesting five servers in total. Three of them are console servers and then two of them, one of them's a uh, fortune cookie consumer, one of them is a fortune cookie uh, client. 
So it's gone and made a request. Uh, it takes a couple of minutes for the machines to boot up. So well, we might speed up or go through, but I want to talk a little about what's happening here. So Terraform is smart enough to know that you want five machines, so it's doing all five machines in parallel. Um, as the machines get turned on, uh, we will pull back some data, and then we're also going to go install the console software. Um, so that'll be our service mesh implementation, and we'll also turn on the Fortune Cookie service. Um, so at, at the conclusion of this, we're going to have five servers in total, three console servers, are going to be running, but they're not going to be clustered together. They're not going to know about each other. So at that point, we'll have to go through and configure it. You can automate it in Terraform to have it go through and cluster it. I have that turned off at this point, just so we can manually go through and see the steps of what's involved in, in clustering together the, uh, the environment. Uh, so at this point, the machines are up. We're copying some software onto it. Um, so there you see that it's called copying a zip file for the console server. Um, we're also installing Vault. Vault is a key management system. So later in this uh, Securing Bare Metal, the next uh, presentation workshop revolves around key management. Okay, so we're at the, just going through. <clears throat> and like I said, the end result is we'll have the five machines up and running. Still copying software onto it. So Vault is installed on each machine? Yeah, so in this example, it's um, the, the end result is to have an environment that'll use Vault to do key management. You need the key management components if you want to go through and encrypt the uh, traffic, the control plane between the console servers. So in this example here, we aren't going through and encrypting that and doing that level of key authentication just for the sake of time. But yes, the, the default installation that I have set up goes through and installs both sets of software. Okay, so at this point, uh, Terraform has replied back. There are the IP addresses of the five machines running, the three console servers, the Fortune Cookie Consumer and the Fortune Cookie Server. So we'll keep this running. We're just doing some pings. And then we also did a netcat to port 8181, which is the... Uh, Fortune Cookie server just to get back that there's a um, that it's running. So we're just going to log in into the cloud provider and take a look at the infrastructure that's been deployed, so we can learn a little bit about the network configuration on it and the IP addresses that have been configured in into it, and then the uh, the um, just a little bit about that hardware environment. Um, so, like I said, we've got five machines running. So we'll see the five machines running here. They're all the same hardware type. They're all running in the same data center. Um, each of them has been set up with a number of different IP addresses. So we've, we get uh, two IPv4 addresses, and then we also get an IPv6. We're not using the IPv6 here. The two IPv4 addresses, we get a management one, which is a private network interface, and then we also get a public internet accessible one. We're going to use that private IP address for the control messaging between the console, between the service mesh um, for data transfers. That private one doesn't leave the data center. Um, and then we'll use the, IP, the public IP address for the external uh, communications. So, so console uh, 0, 0, 0, 001 and, and 0, 02 are all identified, they're all identical. Um, what you saw pull up there, that was a console server to, to get uh, terminal server access to it. Okay, so that's our physical infrastructure. It's up and running. Uh, like I said, we've got three of these console servers up and running. Uh, they're all identical. And now we're going to go log into them, and we're going to join the service mesh together. Um, that's the... Uh, so there are the three IP addresses that are assigned to it. One of them is private, one of them is the public IP4, and then IPv6 address. So we need the initial IP address, because we're going to go through and tell the other two console servers, the IP address of the first one, so they can go, go and uh, cluster together. <coughs> so I just have a little startup script that goes through, and it just uh, starts up the console server. So it uses the, the private IP address. We're just going to pull it out there, and then we're going to start up the um, uh, start up the service mesh binary on this first one. Uh, that config directory. So in there, there's a, just a number of configuration files. Um, the first machine we're starting up in bootstrap mode. So that tells the first instance 
that there are no, no other instances running right now, don't worry, don't try and look for a master instance. All right, so that's the first one we sort of start up um, in a special mode. Okay, so while that one starts up, um, it did an election, it elected itself leader because we're in, in bootstrap mode, there's only the single one. Okay, and then in the second screen, we're starting up the second one. Uh, that second one is going to start up, it's going to panic a little bit because it's not going to, we're not running in bootstrap mode, so it doesn't know about the others. But then what we're going to do is we're going to tell it to join onto the first one. So we're going to run the console join command and then we're going to give it the IP address and we're going to give it that private IPv4 address of the first one. And then we can see that the first one, the logs updated and said that the second one joined. <coughs> we can see the logs of the second one to see that it's gone ahead and joined. And then we are going to go and start up the third one. So console members is going to list all the uh, machines that are running that make up the our cluster at this point. And we can see there's a dot seven and a dot nine, both of them are, are up and running. So DC, that DC column is which data center. So ideally you'd run multiple ones in different data centers. Uh, the service mesh is going to be smart enough to know if you have uh, copies of your microservices running in different data centers, which ones to connect to, to connect to the ones locally within the data center. And we're going to do something different when we start the third one. We're going to start up the third one, we're going to give it the IP address of the second one. And then, so it's going to do the join, it's going to send a message to, the, to that second one, and it's going to say, hey, I want to join. The second console server is going to say, hey, wait, I'm not the leader, and gives it the, inf the IP address of the first one, and then it goes and it messages with the, with the first one. So our second and third service mesh uh, instances um, are just in a passive mode right now, and any requests that come into it get um, sent along to the first one. Okay. So I killed, at this point, I killed the service mesh that first instance we're running, because it was running in a bootstrap mode, and now I'm going to restart it in a, uh, in a regular mode, because now that we have all three instances running, we don't want to run that first one in bootstrap mode. So it's gone through, and the, one of the interesting things you see there, it says console new leader elected, console um, zero 01. So when we first started up, zero, 00 was the leader, the cluster leader, because it, we start up in bootstrap mode. But then when we killed it and we started back up again, that second instance has become the leader. Okay. So at this point, we've got our three console servers running. We are, <clears throat> um, we're basically ready. We can go through and we can start securing our service. <clears throat> okay. So. Let's take a look at what, we, what we're going to do here. So once again, we've got the fortune cookie server, we've got the fortune cookie consumer. We're going to start up the, um, an agent. The agent is the same binary, but we give it a slightly different configuration file to tell it to run in an agent mode. And it's going to go talk to the service mesh. The service mesh is going to keep a directory of all of the services that are running. It's going to register our service onto the service mesh. Um, and then at a later point, we're going to run a sidecar to go along with it. So let's go ahead and see this in action. So we're going to log into the Fortune Cookie server. And we are going to start up the, uh, uh, the console server. But we're going to run it in agent mode. So the difference between agent mode and server mode is the server keeps track of all the services that are running. Uh, agent mode is just goes through and sends information back up about the services that are running on this particular instance. So there we have a configuration file called fortuneservice.json, and all that does is it just lists out that we're running this fortune cookie service on port 8181. So this is how the agent tells the service mesh about the service that we're running. Okay. So as you can see, we are running it in a... Um, the, on the left, you can see we're running in service false, server false, which means do not run the console server. And as opposed to on the right, which is, which is the console server, we're telling the binary when it starts up to run it in server mode. Okay, so on the left here, we're starting up the, the console agent, and then it's gonna go, uh, we're gonna join it. I have it connect in so it joins in with the mesh. So we're going to run a console join. And 
and then we're going to yeah, connect on. We're going to do the console join. We're running the log file on the first one just so we can see what happens. <clears throat> so at this point, our fortune cookie server has joined into the mesh and has registered its services. So we can now see when we go list all the members of the service mesh, we can see our new the fortune cookie service is now running alongside. And all this does is identify the node, the physical infrastructure that's now connected on. And we're going to do the same thing on the fortune cookie consumer. So the fortune cookie consumer wants to use the service mesh because it needs to find out where services are running. Um, console, you can make an API request and ask for information about where, um, make a curl request, just uh, another API request, ask about the, where the services are running, or you can do a DNS query and it'll reply back with information about where the services are running. <clears throat> so we're, we're joining the, the uh, consumer into the service mesh. And at this point we've got all the console servers running, we've got the consumer and we've got the server all joined into the mesh. Okay, we can go through, we can make some requests of the service mesh and ask about the services that are running. We can ask about the nodes that are running. Um, so here we're just using the CLI, you can run, make the same request through the API, you can make the same request through DNS. So a bunch of different ways to go through and, and get the information. Um, we're asking about the services that are running on the fortune cookie server. So it replies back that there's a service running called fortune. Um, and then we can see that there's no services running on the fortune cookie consumer. Okay. So now we've got the um, servers, we've got the whole environment connected. Um, we want to now go through and we actually want to start encrypting our traffic. So we want to make sure that, um, uh, that the traffic can't be read by anyone across the wire. So what we're going to do is we're going to make some changes to our fortune cookie service. Right now we have it bound to the public IP address on port 8181. So we're going to tear that down and instead we're only going to bind to the loopback. So by binding to the loopback, the only processes that are going to be able to make that connection are processes running on that local machine. Um, the console agent is going to be running on that same machine. It's a sidecar process. So it'll be able to connect to that loopback and connect to the service. And it'll now be our front door. So any requests will have to come in through that console agent. It'll go through Authenticate, um, do, handle the encryption, and then make the request through the loopback on that same port to get the answer and then send it back across a secure connection. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to run through here, connect back on to the fortune cookie service. We're going to take a look at the services that are running, right? We've got that fortune cookie service. Um, we are going to start up a new service called fortune cookie encrypted service. So there we see there's the unencrypted service. All we're saying is it just runs on port 8181 and the name of it. And that's, that's used to register the service with the service mesh. So we can see it in action. So there's still value in registering an unencrypted service. The service mesh does uh, service checks, so it makes sure that the service is running. But at this point, we don't have any authentication or any encryption. So we're going to tear down the fortune cookie service. And instead, we're going to copy in the new JSON file. It says that instead, we want requests for this to go through the sidecar. And the sidecar is that console agent that we're running. So we removed the fortune cookie, the unencrypted one. And then we, we're now putting in the, uh, the secure version of it. So all that is is just a JSON file that just describes it. We're not changing the underlying application, that legacy application, that microservice that you're already running. We're just uh, telling the service mesh about it. So now we need to tell it to go through reload the configuration files. So now if we take a look, we can see that there's this Fortune sidecar proxy service. And that is the encrypted one that people external can use. Um, which we can then go and uh, make connections to.
So we need to go through and start these things up. Okay, so we're starting at the sidecar. That's that fortune sidecar proxy. And we're telling it this is the sidecar instance for the service fortune. And that service fortune right now is only bound to that local IP address. So we can see the fortune sidecar process starting up. And then it's listening, but it's externally uh, accessible. Okay. Then on the fortune cookie client, the client can now uh, would now also needs to go through a sidecar to make a request. So we're starting up the same process. We're starting up a proxy on the consumer side. So the request would then go from the consumer on the proxy on that sidecar that's running on the consumer, and then it would make a connection across the wire to the sidecar on the server, which would authenticate it and de-encrypt de it and then send the, pro send the uh, connection over to the actual Fortune server. Okay, so you see port 9191, that's the port we decided we're gonna go and run our sidecar proxy on. So on the upper right-hand corner, we went through the proxy. You see, we, we made a netcat connection to the port 9191, so it went through that whole workflow of connecting through the sidecar on the consumer, across the wire encrypted, and then back and uh, hit the machine on the left-hand side. So on the left here, we're just seeing the uh, logs spitting out the, the message before it goes across. Now, if you noticed here that you will have long, light, long and healthy life, that didn't show up on the right-hand side there. Anyone want to speculate why there was a request there that we didn't originate? It was the health check, right? So the service mesh is periodically going through making a health check, and that's why we saw that request come into the server. But it wasn't us actually making a request from the client side. So you can see right now we're, we're bound to the, uh, just to the loopback. Or sorry, right now we're bound to, to all the ports because our bind is zero, so we're going to change that to the, uh, to the loop back. So before, anyone could still could connect to the, from the internet onto it, so by changing the binds just to the loop back, we're going to secure our application, so now it's not accessible to the rest of the world. Okay. So <clears throat> the next step we're going to go through, we're going to spin up some additional console servers, we're going to go through and show how we can do some service resilience. So we're going to, sorry, we're going to spin up some additional fortune cookie servers. And we're going to get um, up to, I think, four servers running, three or four servers running, and then we're going to go through and kill them. Okay, so we're going to talk about service resilience. That's the other part. So we're going to scale up. We're going to update our Terraform configuration file, tell it we don't want a single uh, fortune cookie server anymore. We want three. Um, we're going to change the configuration file. We're going to rerun um, Terraform. Terraform will go through and figure out the changes that are needed. And we'll spin up the additional hardware. And at this point, I've gone and I've turned on the automation that will actually do the joining. So we don't actually have to go through and do that joining by hand that you saw me do. So you can automate it in Terraform. It goes through and it pulls out the IP address of that first console server and it passes it on as a parameter to all the other instances that are spun up. So you don't have to go through and, and do that, those commands by hand. Um, I'm going to speed up so we don't actually have to go through and see the hardware being spun up. You can just take my word for it that it gets spun up. Okay, so at this point we can see we have three fortune cookie servers running. They are all joined onto the service mesh because we did a request for all the members and we see that they're all there. Um, we can go through and make requests to the um, unsecure ports to see that those additional instances, so the first one is secure because we did that one by hand, but the second and third ones are not secure. 
um, they have not been uh, unbound from that uh, port zero. So now I'm going through and I'm enabling that secure service. So we're gonna skip through that because you guys have seen it already. And let's get to the point where we start. So we're removing the bind from all the interfaces, just the single loopback. And then we're starting up those sidecar proxies. <clears throat> and we are now gonna start making some requests and then we will go through. So let's go back a little bit. Okay, so at this point we have three servers running. Um, we are gonna go and kill one of them and just validate that so I'm doing a shutdown halt. So this is physical hardware. I'm shutting it down so it goes away. At this point, the service mesh doing its health checks are validating, hey, what servers are things still running on? It's going to notice that it's down on one of them, removes that from the, from the service mesh. But our netcat keeps on running just fine. We still keep on getting requests from the remaining two servers. So now we're going to connect to the second machine. And we're going to kill that one. And then we're going to go back and we're going to keep on doing our requests through the service mesh. It'll take a second for the um, health checks to update. Oops. <clears throat> so there we go. We can see that it's now making requests to the, to the last remaining one. And then we will go and we will kill the, uh, the last machine. So at this point, all of the Fortune Cookie servers are dead. So unfortunately, the service mesh can't help us at this point. And uh, we don't get a response back. OK, so real quick, what we've gone through here is we've taken a microservice, our little Fortune Cookie service. We haven't made any changes to it. We haven't had to recompile it. We had you know, add any features, no development time. We've turned on a service mesh. We've clustered the service mesh together. We've turned on the uh, sidecar which introduce the encryption of the data across the network. Um, so at this point, we basically have got, we've resolved that issue of someone being able to tap in and being able to see that fortune being acro run across the wire. And so that's no longer visible because that traffic is being encrypted. Um, obviously, these are just, this is the basics of using a service mesh, but hopefully, you know, it's opened up your eyes to how easy it is to really add in authentication, encryption, and service resilience into an existing application you might be running. Any questions I can answer? Yeah. Oh, there's a mic. Uh, how does console do gateways, implement gateways for external traffic going into the mesh? Uh, so I know uh, external traffic coming into the mesh. So you mean if someone isn't running a proxy, a sidecar proxy? Yes, exactly. Like uh, all their gateway implementations. Or yeah, so then I think you're, uh, you're sort of outside the, the realm of a service mesh, because the service mesh, the idea is that both the consumers and the services are communicating through that service mesh to learn about it. Um, you could still use the capabilities, you could still register the services through service mesh, and the DNS capabilities would, um, would provide that health check and everything. Um, but you're not going to get that client and server side authentication of, of the certificates between it. So I would look at this more as a solution for when you own both of the consumers and the clients, sort of east-west traffic rather than coming in externally from the, from the just uh, public internet at, at general. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, so you showed that the sidecar proxy can uh, uh, get you secure transport of the of your application's data. Um, but is the uh, like the whole TLS, uh, the the trust chain, and everything is that also the uh, is it also validated? Um, uh, yeah. So when you connect. So, so there's client side and server side certificates. So it's authenticating both the client and the server. Um, we touched on at the beginning vaults. 
Vault is a key management solution. So that's sort of the next part of that is the distribution of keys. So yes, we are encrypting traffic. We, are, we did not go through and turn on the authentication in this example here, just, for the, just to limit the scope. Oh. But that would be the next level, would be to have a um, go through and define that fortune, things that are fortune cookie servers can talk to fortune cookie consumers, but they can't talk to other consumers. So you'd go through and define those relationships. Yeah. And as you turn on new instances and turn off new instances, the relationship with IP addresses goes away, so you just need to worry about the Fortune Cookies clients, consumers can talk to each other, and the service mesh keeps track of where those are running. But yeah, that would be the next the next step is going through defining those those authentication rules. Um, do you have any pro or contrast of, for, for example, if I'm would running Kubernetes on bare metal with Istio? Okay. But because it sounds to me like it's a similar yeah, they're both service, solution. Yeah, they're both service mesh implementations. Uh, the real example that I was showing here is you don't have to go through and containerize your application. You don't have to run it on top of Kubernetes to get service mesh. A lot of people think service mesh, they immediately turn to Kubernetes mm -hmm. and they think I need to use Istio or, or something else like that. And, sure. and the idea is that, yeah, you can do this without having on more legacy without having to go through spend the development so, cycle. So you don't really compare that or you just used console and... Uh... Yeah, so it's the same high-level construct of, you know, both of them have the same capabilities. Yeah, so I, okay. I wasn't trying to say console is the solution. It's more of a general, hey, this is what service mesh can, can give you. But yeah, there's a bunch of different service mesh implementations. Thank you. Just a quick follow-up. Uh, you picked console. Is there, was there any particular features that you needed from console, or were it applicable for all kinds of service meshes, like Istio or um, other ones? So I picked console because I didn't need to have the dependency of Kubernetes and running it in containerized environments. Um, so this was an example of how can I run this directly on top of bare metal without um, additional uh, additional layer of software infrastructure. So. Um, without having to go through an, an extra development cycle. For you know, a lot of projects I get into, they just want encryption, they want authentication, they want some of these features, um, but they don't want to go through the, the process of moving into a containerized solution. All right, thank you, John. Yeah.